Welcome to the Future of Work podcast. Today, my guest is Christopher, Fleisch, Christopher Fleischman of Arthur. Uh, Chris, Hi, has, uh, Chris has uh, joined the virtual reality world in 2013. In fact, even before that, he co-founded in 2011 a machine learning startup that went on to become an early leader with two uh, virtual reality companies, InFlight VR and Megaparticle. Uh, that's the company b behind Poker VR for you poker players out there. In 2016, Fleischmann founded Arthur Technologies. Arthur is a VR-based dynamic collaboration meeting solution. Uh, since its inception, Fleischmann has scaled Arthur up to 50 employees internationally, has seen the platform adopted by renowned organizations around the world, such as the United Nations, Societe Generale, and many other corporate uh, users I uh, understand today. So welcome, Chris. Uh, very grateful to have you on our program today. Thanks for having me, Frank. You know, it's funny. I, I'll start off just by saying I've had the opportunity to don a headset and uh, uh, live inside of Arthur for a couple of days. And I found it uh, fascinating. Um, it was uh, uh, exactly what I had hoped as a work experience. Uh, I was able to move around your office building complex, uh, interface with other individuals as if I was there, uh, attend lectures in a theater and auditorium, everything I could do if I actually went to a live convention. Uh, so I know that uh, we aren't 100% yet. There's still a lot of work to go, but still it was completely immersive. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start off and, and, and ask you, how do you define the metaverse and virtual reality's role within it uh, as compared to augmented reality as, a, as an example? Um, and how do you see things blending together uh, as we adopt to more and more hybrid work and remote work formats? Big question. Uh, sorry for, for so much yeah. all at once. Let, <laughs> no, let's I get in. It's, <laughs> no, I think it's, it's good to get definitions right. Um, I, I'm not sure whether we in 2022 can truly define the metaverse. I think we have an idea where this virtual world is going to go and we have this indications what components will be there. Um, but I'm pretty sure that if you ask me my definition of what I consider a metaverse um, is, uh, sorry, the metaverse is, it might be different from um, some other, other folks in the industry. For me, the metaverse is the logical evolution of everything we have done until now in the digital space. Um, I, I do believe the three-dimensional component is, is important in its definition, meaning it's a three-dimensional digital world that I can visit. Um, and I think in order for it to constitute the metaverse, um, I want to be able to retain my identity throughout different experiences. And these experiences might be something very consumer-oriented, like a game or a social experience or a concert or very business oriented, like a training simulation or, or a convention or a business meeting in my company. And it's, I, I think the, the definition where I would really call it the metaverse is if, if I take my identity from, let's say, you can already do this right now on, on a VR headset, you can play a round of golf. You know, you and I could, could go on, on the golf course. And I actually highly recommend trying this out because it's, it's a ton of fun. Oh, you've not um, seen and, play golf. You, you might not want to recommend that. <laughs> well, I can assure you, uh, I have ways to go to, to be even a decent player. So it, it's just fun. Um, and, and for me, if, if, if you and I could go from this virtual golf course where we just had like a fun round of you know, nine holes and then go directly towards the meeting space, and work out on something, work on something business related, that would for me constitute the metaverse, like this moment where, and I think it, the definition I chose is it should con, you know, consist of both the professional world, the business world, but also the kind of consumer K 
casual social world. Um, within the metaverse, which is this three-dimensional space, um, the way I, I, I would say we will mostly use it is through what is now predominantly called mixed reality headsets. And, and mixed reality is a term that encompasses both virtual reality as well as different derivations of virtual reality where we blend the real world and the virtual world together. So um, to make it a little bit more simple, virtual reality is what the majority of people try out when they put on a real VR headset. It means I, I put on this headset and I'm in a fully digital world. I have nothing of my real world anymore, anymore around. And that is VR. Uh, for me personally, however, I think it's, this is only one part of the whole equation because most of our day, we will probably not want to spend 100% in this world. We will probably still want to see our desk, maybe our coffee cup or something if we're talking about a work scenario. And this is where mixed reality comes in, where I can easily choose between seeing some parts of the real world in some parts of the digital world. So it's not as invasive to my real, to my real life um, as full virtual reality is. And for me personally, the metaverse actually also includes these mixed reality experiences. So I think I'm also, if I want to work in the metaverse, I can pick a type of experiences where I'm still partly in the real world and partly in this digital world. Um, that, that would be for me the the whole spectrum of, um, of this. this well, you know, I, I would have media. to agree with that for two reasons. First, um, when I was in the Arthur experience, uh, totally immersed in the virtual reality with the headset on, um, I actually lost my orientation to my desk. <laughs> yeah. uh, knocked my cup of coffee over. Uh, <laughs> that that happens. Pretty, that pretty, I would have liked to have been able to see my coffee. But the, yeah. the, the other thing, too, is, is I think that the human mind's an interesting and unlimited capacity. It, it's the, the most right. amazing computer we'll ever, ever have. And we can deal with multiple, um, I don't want to say realities, but with multiple types of media simultaneously yeah. um, uh, very easily. Um, and I think... Uh, uh, holographic projection is a good example of that. Uh, okay. We can just as easily, you and I today, we could just as easily have set this meeting up. I don't know how Daniel would have recorded it, but we could have set it up with a HoloLens set up yep. uh, easy enough. Mm -hmm. And you could have sat in my office or I could have sat in yours and conducted the same conversation. Yep. That's another layer of reality in three dimensions compared to what we're doing today, which is what people are used to. Yeah. So we're using a medium today that people are comfortable with because they understand it, where tomorrow we'll be using something entirely different. Yeah. Uh, and I guess when, when we talk about our primary focus, which is the future of work, how do you see adjustments being made in the workplace? Uh, do you see that We'll go into an office, um, uh, dial up uh, our favorite background uh, on our headset. That'll become our visual, physical office around us, even though we might be in a small cube and the, not the best part of town because we don't have to be in the best part of town anymore because we can be anywhere we want. Uh, <laughs> so costs can go down. How do you see um, all of that? relating to remote work in particular and what we just experienced with uh COVID-19 which kind of forced us into a whole new paradigm yeah I think if if, if we zoom out a little bit and look at this two year long experiment where we were forced to immediately adopt yes. either a, a radically hybrid work model or even a fully remote work model. Um, I think there is this a, a critical mass of people. And, and, and if you look at studies from BCG or, or PwC, like the overwhelming majority of people say, 
why on earth should we go back five days a week, uh, five days a week to the office? Like we're just standing, you know, in traffic jams in our cars, like we're burning gas to then sit in an office to anyways be on, you know, on conference calls with other offices, with people who are also not physically in our place. And I think there is a, I'm, I'm sure you also read about, you know, Tesla, for example, mandating home office again. Sure. It's almost weird. having you, this you little whip. You gave me a call directly before he made that decision. <laughs> yeah. I, I can, can imagine that. Um, and so, so if you put these two things together, you're, you're, you're at least I, I think to myself, okay, clearly people want this. And clearly this experiment was incredibly successful and on many way, on many levels, because we, we were successful at continuing with, you know, delivering services. The world didn't stop when we went, when we stopped going to the office. The people, especially management, top management, want, want people back. And this is because we're missing two things. If we're working through two-dimensional screens with each other, we're, we're missing a deeper level of connection to our team, which is the social dimension. And we're missing the ability to actually go deeper on productivity and collaboration to actually have more complex discussions. So these are two elements where no matter the tool you use, you feel, especially if you have a group of five, six people plus, you feel like you're stuck in second gear. So you're not actually translating all the potential of the people you have in this virtual meeting into output. And neither are you creating these serendipitous connections, this team spirit that you're used to in a physical workplace. So for me, we've seen this incredible preview, but we've also had a realization that there are still things missing to actually make remote and hybrid work. And it, it follows, I think, quite logically that we are just limited by what current technology can do. If I look through this window to you, it's great to record this session. It's great to have this conversation, but we could, if we were actually in 3D together, we could probably go even further in terms of how we, how we work together. And, and this is just because this medium, VR and mixed reality is so much more intense. It's, you know, what is more intense than actually having the display directly in front of your eyes and you being part of this digital world. And so what we actually explore with clients is how do VR and MR, so virtual reality and mixed reality, solve this hybrid work conundrum where everybody everybody actually wants to pull it off but we're just limited by the current tools and especially on these two dimensions the social connectivity and deeper collaboration vr can deliver massively for organizations so it's it's a in a, if we extrapolate this it's you will have freedom. It's, it's not going to be everyone in the office with VR headset. It's not going to necessarily be everyone remote. It's just going to not matter where you are. Geography just becomes no longer a dominating factor in your life when it comes to productivity. It just becomes something you, you're aware of. You might choose to go to an office if you want to have a cup of coffee with your colleagues. But the way it's going to feel like is, at least that's our vision, that no matter where I am in the world, I have the ability to put on an advanced mixed reality headset and feel like I'm in our office. I have all of the positive emotions of being there with my coworkers. I have all of the capabilities and the attention of people that I enjoy when I'm actually in a workshop physically with them. But I can choose to do it from wherever I am. If I happen to be in the office, maybe you and I are in a conference room and we dial in, quote unquote, three of our colleagues who are not, it will just seamlessly work. They will just visit our physical meeting space and they will appear as holograms to us. Or we say we all, all five of us, fully commit to the virtual world and no, our physical meeting space ceases to matter. We might actually flip a switch where the desk in front of us disappear, disappears, the floor disappears, our walls disappear, and we're fully in a virtual campus. And this is 
really the vision we are we're looking at and i think a lot of companies are searching for that is truly about overcoming any sort of limitation that is caused by geography and well, you know, if a technology I, can deliver it it's it's this set of technologies yeah I, I i know in our own company we operate globally as you know and uh, we've always taken the view that uh, geography is not important. We want the yeah. best person with the most intelligent, highest capabilities uh, to work with us. And we don't require that they relocate. Yeah. Uh, we never have. Um, we don't think that disrupting of families, uh, adding costs to the corporate side or the individual yeah. side, that any of that provides benefit to anybody. If it's you're great. Italian and you love living in Rome, uh, what's it going to cost me to move you to Texas? A lot. And you're not going to be happy here. You're always going to be saying, well, when I retire, I'm going back to Rome. So you should just stay in Rome. Uh, uh, and, and, and we can all work together. I think time zones have an impact on, on that to a degree. Um, I know you're in Vienna and I'm in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, and so yeah. uh, we've got a seven hour time difference between us uh, right now. So it's evening for you and early afternoon for me. Uh, right. You get used to that, but that also impacts your work life balance when you're working across two broad time zones. Uh, and that's going that to be true. disruptive. So that, that's not a good thing uh, overall. But as at the technology of virtual reality is moving along at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, not as rapid as some people would like to see it, as, as you've seen by, mm -hmm. by recent uh, uh, announcements by various companies. Um, mm -hmm. But it's still moving along very rapidly, and, and we'll be embracing it fully within the next couple of years. But as we embrace it, do you see the individual gamers, let's start at the bottom of that, that community, embracing it and bringing it to the workplace? Or do you see, you mentioned Elon Musk, do you see someone like Elon Musk embracing it and forcing the workforce to utilize it? Because it's going to take some pressures to evolve this to where somebody says, oh, by the way, if you want to work here, this is the way we do it. And certain right. people go, oh, cool, I got to do that. And other people are going, whoa. I'm not sure about that. And in a world where there's a battle for talent, how is that going to play out in your view? And what the heck are governments going to do about it? Yeah, a couple, couple of questions here, I think, in there that, that are all super interesting. Um, to the question of whether it's going to be gamers introducing this to the professional world, um, I don't think so. I think we are seeing a strong bifurcation in this early version of the metaverse that we're observing that is unfolding right now, where you have this gaming social world that is completely isolated from the enterprise adoption. So you have to- I'm, 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 I'm gonna interrupt on that yeah. for a second. Um, yeah, sure. Tesla employs, I don't know how many people, let's just say 100,000 people worldwide. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. um, name the top three, and that's a community. Okay, name the top three games, and each one of them has multiple millions of people yeah. interacting individually and as teams simultaneously right. overall on a global basis. So any of the larger games has 10 to 100 times the members that a company like Tesla or Cisco or IBM, uh, Google, uh, any of the companies has, and they're interacting as individuals, following rules and working as teams in a competitive environment. So I'm challenging the thought process there that there's not going to be an evolutionary structure where some of the gaming technologies that are used and some of the theories around community development that are used and applied to the corporate world. 
Well, I think if we talk about knowledge transfer, um, I 100% agree with you. I mean, technically, Arthur is a video game. So we're basically yes. selling a video game to Fortune 500 companies every day. And we're actually selling not only a video game, we're even telling them to use VR headsets that right now in 2022 are built predominantly on the paradigms of video game consoles. Um, Correct. But this is changing in, in a way that VR is going through almost a, a renaissance kind of era in this year where it is actually, while there is still a ton of knowledge sharing between this, um, between the gaming world and what is being innovated in the gaming world, there is this evolution that virtual reality is going through, which is adding mixed reality, which is adding, for example, the ability to have your keyboard vis uh, visible in VR, where it, it, it is becoming a computing device. And if we look at the actual users, the people using this, I think we, we really have have two very, very distinct user groups that are, tr that are driving this adoption rapidly forward, like from two ends they're coming. One is, um, if you want to call it the consumer bottom-up gaming and social push, one is the very, very top-end, you know, highly innovative enterprises that want to solve collaboration, creativity, talent retention from the top. And if you look at the actual users and the applications, I do think you see um, a, a strong bifurcation in how they use it, what matters to them more um, in terms of functionality and so on. But there's a ton of cross-communication happening. There, there well, I, I, yeah, I, I think your comment about mixed realities uh, mm -hmm. uh, is very important here because yeah. if you look at the devices that are being created mm -hmm. right now, um, it seems that they're evolving away from the video, totally immersive video game headset environment yeah. where you're totally immersed. You can't you can't look out of it, uh, outside exactly. of it. You have to live inside of it. Um, and and it seems like some people are going minimalist, but that takes me and and nobody is succeeding at that yet. It appears. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to get there, but not quite there yet. Everybody's putting <laughs> off their big announcements right now. Um, but they'll get there. They will get there. But that takes me to the next question of uh, augmented intelligence. Uh, let's go back yeah. to Elon Musk and let's put a few uh, extra wires, connect them to your brain and see what we can do. So do you see virtual reality or mixed reality? being an augmentation that includes embedded devices inside of our brain or inside attached to our eyes or attached in some ways to us physically to where we become not just a hybrid worker, but a worker who is in fact a hybrid. Yeah. So, I think right now we are already seeing augmented intelligence in at least the, the use cases we're seeing. Um, what we're essentially doing is a lot of our work is recreating physical meetings, but obviously we don't. My, my laptop is augmented intelligence, uh, yeah. if you will. I'm smarter yeah, exactly. when I have my laptop than, than when I don't. 100%. It's these superpowers we can add on to these physical meetings. So it looks and feels a lot like a physical meeting, but you have superpowers, both you know, physically in this virtual world, but also in terms of information, the ability to look up information or calculate or stuff like this. So definitely we're seeing this. Um, I do think that brain computer interfaces will probably eventually go so far that they might replace the hardware we use to access the metaverse. Because um, probably even smarter than going through our visual senses um, is to, I mean, I'm sure it sounds very crazy right now, but it might not in you know, 10, 20 years, is to directly interface with your brain. And so I, I definitely think it's a logical evolution from VR and mixed reality towards um, some sort of human computer interface that directly connects with um, with your brain. 
Um, whether this is then something where you have contact lenses and something that um, connects with with your brain with maybe a non-invasive surgery or something that where you can control the virtual world. I think there have some have been some quite exciting oh. R and D topics around that. Whether it's a wristband that can take up micro impulses from your muscles and your or your brain. Um, and, and that might already constitute this or a full-on surgery um, uh, that I'm, I'm not sure what we will find well, we're seeing appropriate. Surgery, um, uh, for people that have uh, problems with the loss of limbs and things of that, we're, yeah. we're seeing uh, interfaces there that, that are, are pretty effective. And yeah. uh, I know in Sweden and, and in Norway now, I believe, too, we're doing implants that give us the ability to um, just a chip implant, kind of like you do with, with a dog for ID, uh, but yeah. it's an ID chip implant for uh, the ability to ride trains, buses, buy things from vending machines, et cetera. It, it gives swipe a whole new word, a whole new definition. Mm -hmm. um, so we are seeing things like that even today on, on a yeah. miniature basis. Um, but uh, uh, so it, it it's be interesting to see how far we go, uh, and it'll be interesting to calculate the moral factor uh, involved in that. We're getting a little off the future of work here, and so I'll, 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 that's I'll, part of it, right? <laughs> and I'll try and I'll try and take us back to that. Um, artificial intelligence is a requirement in all of this. And I guess it was Google today started saying, oh, you know, our AI uh, computers are starting to develop emotion. <laughs> okay, that was their announcement today. Now, what that means is, is my computer mad at me? Does my computer love me? Um, uh, or, you know, how subtle or how overt are, uh, is that development? And is it, in fact, even real? How important is that to virtual reality? Um, should the reality itself have an artificial intelligence providing things to you that you might not be thinking of yet? Yeah. So we, we have this thought experiment a lot. You know, let, let's assume in two years I have an advanced mixed reality headset. I put it on no matter where I am in the world. I walk into the lobby of my office. I run, to, run into a colleague, but maybe I'm late for a meeting or something and I actually go, you know, I just briefly say hi and I go, go towards this meeting and maybe I have some sort of digital assistant for my, let's call it a brainstorming meeting. We want to come up with some cool product ideas or something like this. And while we're talking, you know, maybe about a new line of shoes we want to create, a new product line, the AI is feeding the room with additional data um, that might be useful for a meeting. I think this is a very simple um, example where you can, with with powerful AI that probably exists already today, um, you can augment your meeting experience. And it's I, I don't think you need sentient general AI for for it to already play a very powerful role in the metaverse. Um, I think regarding the Google announcement, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's a little bit debated whether the the statement was overplayed. Um, of course, you know, whether whether they were really <laughs> sentient. Um, yeah, but yeah, but I think it's I, I think many people underestimate. You know, like AI. It's similar to VR, right? Like it's been around for a couple of years. Everybody was like in the first two years, everybody expect was expecting it to happen next year. Always, you know, that the matrix is there. And it just took some time because there were some really hard problems to solve. And it's, it's the same with AI, but suddenly some of these hard problems get solved and you have this exponential growth in its potency. And I think you're seeing this for both AI and, and, and VR right now. And, and that's an interesting convergence or inflection point for both of these technologies, which arguably next to automation might have the strongest effect on well, all work. When you talk about exponential growth, yeah. you talk about an advantage, okay? And right now the world is very unsettled uh, geopolitically. 
uh, we're dealing with a lot of problems. Uh, no matter which side of what issue, there's problems. Um, uh, we have a lot of first world issues and a lot of third world issues. Do you see this, and this is kind of a wrap up question because we're, we're running long here, but do you see virtual reality as a, an advantage for those that literally can afford it because it's not cheap? Neither is it cheap to deploy it. Change management, getting everybody on the, a new format, it's sort of like, magically an entire corporate population of one company or two companies will have this capacity and no one else will. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you see that or no one else will with the same critical mass? Okay. Uh, do you I... see that as being elemental in uh, certain companies taking massive advancement and therefore massive market share and economic advancement or countries doing the same thing uh, and leading others behind? Or do you see it more holistically, which we'd all like to, but um, be real here, uh, mm -hmm. what's really going to happen in your view um, to where it allows third world environments to catch up? And how will that happen? How, 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 how could you deploy it uh, yeah. in, a, in, in a country that doesn't, doesn't have water or telephony even in many parts? Right. And we can think of different parts of the world like that. How could you deploy this type of technology that would allow them to catch up by comparison to deploying it in the Silicon Valley and having Google dominate the world? <laughs> Okay, I mean, you know, th these are our, our, our yeah. if we look at the future of work, we have to look at it, all aspects yeah. of it. It's an important consideration. Absolutely. I think um, to the first part, there's going to be companies that will play this brilliantly and they will have an unfair advantage for probably years to come. This is like being ahead of the curve with the internet. But if, if you work like me in this space and you see what is being created in there, it's, it's not hard to imagine that this is actually 10 or 100 times bigger than the internet, just because how pervasive it can be in our lives and how much can be done. So I think you're going to see an insane amount of value creation that some companies will definitely capitalize on. So I think that's the supply side, the company and corporate side where you will have some giants emerging. On the general public, what it means for the world itself and its citizens, I have, however, a very, very positive view because I'm a firm believer that one of the greatest sources of misery on earth is geography, is the geographical distance that you have, that the average person has from industrial nations, uh, safe nations and rich nations. Um, a world where we can have a technology where geography doesn't matter is also a world where it doesn't matter anymore where you're born. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you will get a visa or not for a certain country. As long as you, we can somehow get them access to these devices and an internet connection, we can ironically for a three-dimensional world make, make the world itself very flat and egalitarian. And I, I do believe you will have challenges, but, um, and, and, and of course, this is not going to be free, this technology, but it's gonna be infinitively less expensive than any flight or any visa or any other way of how you might wanna break out of a chain uh, chain of poverty. So I, I do think that for the general public, while you, while you will have probably some metaverse giants evolving, there is this potential. And I think states should realize this in the United Nations is thankfully, I think, realizing a lot of its potential, what this can do in terms of good for people around the world. Well, I, I think one of the points that I'd like to make it, that we're, we haven't touched on, but I think is critical, when we look at the future of work, 
we always are always looking forward yeah. from a given point in time. But if we look at the human spectrum on the same issue and say, let's look at 25 year olds. Okay. And what does their future of work look like over their career path? Okay. We also, when we look at the future of work, we also have, and, and this deals with your, 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 uh, third country issues. Um, we also have to look at, uh, the future of education. Yep. So if you can't bring people into this metaverse, into this virtual reality world, unless they're well educated. Um, therefore the starting point on the path to virtual reality isn't the team at Google that's going to conquer the world. It's really the educators that are going to teach children how to function in this world and how to speed up what they're able to learn so that visas and where you're born and the color of your skin really doesn't matter. If you don't take the future of work back to the future of education, then none of this is going to succeed in my opinion. Um, I, I tend to agree with you that it's going to be critical. I do think we're dealing with something with actually a much more accessible medium than many people think, because a well, lot I, of the I, paradigm... I, I've lived in it for a couple of days, and, and I'm, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I'm quite I, hopeful that there will be, like, there's a lot of, you know, research around how much more effective training is actually in VR, so training anything, also training yep. you on VR itself is more effective um, in this medium. And I kind of, I'm, I'm always amazed by how quickly any type of person actually tends to pick up how to, how to grab something in author, because, you know, in our application, you actually make a fist, you, you sure. grab something. And sure. it's this, I think it's called skeuomorphic design, right? Where we take principles from the real world and apply it to a digital world, even though the rules are different in the digital world. We're still bringing design principles into the virtual world to make it more accessible. And so I, I, I think, um, you know, at the, at the very least, it's going to be like smartphones that I think are one of the biggest value creation drivers for the third world. And um, there's going to be an amazing, you know, area of innovation to bring it to more people. And, and I fully support your statement that we do have to look at this and countries and companies need to invest in that to make it as accessible as possible. Otherwise, we we will create another, you know, um, society that lives and has access to this metaverse and can enjoy all of its beauty. And, and we lock some other people out that that would be very, very sad for a medium that is so, by definition, so inclusive. Well, I'll go the other way. And, and then we have to wrap up. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pushing 73 years old, uh, and it took me two hours to get immersed into this system. Um, uh, and so, uh, when we look back to young people in this situation, we always have to also have to look to, uh, older people and see how they'll, they can adapt to it. And I'm just here to tell your audience, not my audience, but your audience right now is that uh, this is very adaptable, it's very workable, and you don't live in that environment, but you do use that environment as you immerse yourself in it. And the really good thing about meetings in that environment, nobody's multitasking. Nobody's doing the thing in the water in the meeting. They're in the meeting. Uh, and that is a huge benefit when we talk about what goes on in the classic Zoom environment. Yeah. Half, half the people in the Zoom environment are not in the Zoom meeting. They're on the screen, true. but they're doing their email. They're doing five other things. And so that's one of the reasons you don't get the, the benefit from them, which Very is much not a agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chris, I, I can't thank you enough for spending time with me today. Um, I'm really Likewise, Frank. Looking forward to following your path, following helping you guide us through the world of virtual reality, not just today, but tomorrow and next year and the next year. Let's stay totally connected on this because it is evolving quickly. And most people just see the headlines, but they 
don't understand uh, the possibilities. So thank, thank you, you and so we'll much. Talk to uh, the next edition. Thank you. Thank you for having me and see you soon in the metaverse.